Hello, everybody. I want to welcome you to this special event of Carolina Public Humanities, which is a conversation with our friend Professor William Luchtenberg, the William Rand Keenan Jr. Professor of History Emeritus at UNC Chapel Hill. And we're very happy to have him here with us today. I'm Lloyd Kramer, a professor of history at UNC Chapel Hill, and also the director of Carolina Public Humanities. And we're coming to you today from beautiful Flyleaf Books here in Chapel Hill, which is once again open after the pandemic. Flyleaf is an independent bookstore where Carolina Public Humanities has held many public events in recent years, including some memorable presentations by Professor Luchtenberg in the room where we're now sitting. I want to thank Flyleaf Books for allowing us to use this space as a humanities studio. And I also thank my colleague, Paul Bonici, who is managing the technology and has managed our technical uh, programming throughout this year of the pandemic. And Paul will also be monitoring, monitoring Q&A uh, during the later part of this uh, discussion. We're going to have an opportunity for you to ask questions of Professor Luchtenberg as we move into the last section of our conversation. And what you should do is enter your question into the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And you can enter your comments and questions there, and Paul will convey them to us uh, during the last half hour of this meeting. I also want to thank some of our CPH sponsors and partners, including Carolina Meadows, a continuing care retirement community here in Chapel Hill. I want to thank the Cotton Merca Group at Morgan Stanley, the UNC General Alumni Association, and the North Carolina Society, all of whom help us to sustain our humanities-centered conversations and public events. And I especially want to thank my longtime history colleague, Bill Luchtenberg, for joining us today for this conversation. This event offers Carolina Public Humanities an opportunity to recognize and celebrate Perfect Professor Luchtenberg, who recently received an important honor. He was given an honorary degree for the Doctorate of Humane Letters at the UNC graduation events in May of this year. So in addition to his long affiliation with UNC Chapel Hill, he now holds a much deserved degree from his university. He has finally gotten to his degree. <laughs> and our community here at Carolina Public Humanities is very pleased that this degree recognizes Professor Luchtenberg's humanistic achievements and his engagement with the public humanities. So we're going to talk with him today about how he became a historian, how he developed and explored his particular historical interests, and how his work has connected with public life, or what we might call the public humanities. But I want first to note that Professor Luchtenberg received his BA degree at Cornell University, and then went on to complete his PhD in history at Columbia University. He later joined the faculty in the history department at Columbia in 1952, and he taught there for about 30 years until 1982, when he wisely moved to Chapel Hill to become the William Rand Keenan Jr. Professor of History. He has taught generations of undergraduate students and he's trained a very impressive number of distinguished professional historians who have gone on to make their own important contributions to historical scholarship and to historical education. He has also been a prolific author whose influential publications include far more books and articles than I could ever mention here. But I do want particularly to note his classic book, Franklin D. Roosevelt and the New Deal, 1932 to 1940, first published in 1943, 1963, I'm sorry, in 1963, which received the prestigious Bancroft Prize for an outstanding work published in American history that year. 
He has also written many other books on the American presidency, including In the Shadow of FDR, From Harry Truman to Barack Obama, that's the updated version published in 2009, and The American President, From Teddy Roosevelt to Bill Clinton, which appeared in 2015. And he continues to work on books to this day. But he's also been much involved in public history projects, and he served as a consultant and collaborator with Ken Burns on various documentary film projects. And finally, I should note that Professor Luchtenberg is the only historian who has been elected to serve as president of the Society of American Historians, a position he held between 1979 and 1981, the Organization of American Historians, a position he held in 1985-86, and the American Historical Association, a position he held in 1991. So you can see that, that he is a very worthy recipient of the Honorary Doctorate of Humane Letters. That's why we're celebrating his work today. So I thank you, Bill, for all that you've done over many decades. And now I want to begin a question with a question that is actually a historical question. I, I want to begin by talking a little about how you became a historian. And my, my first question is, where did you grow up and did your interest in history emerge from your youthful experiences or education? When did you become interested in history? I uh, uh, was raised in a borough of Queens in New York City, uh, which is uh, the northwestern most uh, part of Long Island, uh, across the East River from Manhattan. Though the particular community in which I mostly lived, Elmhurst, was about six miles uh, away from Manhattan, headed out toward the eastern end of the, of the island. Uh, the, uh, my, uh, neither of my parents went to college, hmm. and in fact, neither of them went to high school. Really? Hmm. Uh, and so there weren't many books in the, in the house. Uh, what, there, what there was was a geography book and a Rand McNally atlas. I can still see it. Hold it in your hands, uh, blue, blue cover. And uh, geography was what fascinated me. Uh, the, the interest in, uh, in history uh, came in a somewhat happenstance way. Somehow, uh, I, there came to the house a, a battered old American history textbook uh, written by a man named Gordy otherwise not known to history. <laughs> uh, and it had uh, a great number of illustrations of uh, steel engravings of presidents who had names that weren't the names of other guys on my block. Uh, Zachary Taylor, uh -huh. <laughs> Rutherford B. Hayes. <laughs> and I wanted to know more about them, which may be not only uh, the explanation of my interest in history, but p more particularly of uh, political history and especially uh, presidential history. Ah, so you really came from a background without a lot of engagement with historical studies because you found no. it on your own. No. So well, the you uh, must have gone to a good school. This is <laughs> <laughs> you're anticipating me, Lloyd. Uh, I did indeed go to uh, very good schools, especially a very good high school. Uh, I was told it had 10,000 students in wow. it, uh, much bigger than most folks' memories of, of, their, of their high school. And it was in the Great Depression. I entered in 1935, left in 39. And the, it was an era where uh, there weren't many jobs open for college professors. And we had uh, a great number of PhDs on the, mm. on the faculty. And among the uh, uh, teachers 
who had an influence was a history teacher. Uh, the school was large enough that it has its own hall of fame, uh, including wow. uh, members of the legislature, uh, the Olympic athletes, people of that sort. And some years ago, I was elected to its hall of fame. And I went to the school and entered the auditorium that I hadn't been into since I was 16 years old and found myself up on stage uh, talking about my experience at Newtown High School. The, uh, I knew that uh, the, uh, the names of the teachers I had then would mean nothing to the students yeah. in the audience yeah. and probably nothing to anybody on the staff, but I felt compelled uh, to uh, mention the name of my, of my teacher uh, and what an influence she had on me. Among other things, uh, she talked about spending summers at Columbia's history department, uh, getting additional training. Mm -hmm. Of course, not knowing at that point that one day I'd be a member of that uh, uh, department. And uh, the, uh, a few days later, I got a perfumed uh, blue envelope uh, and I pulled out the letter and said, Dear William, and it was my teacher, Mrs. Hayes, uh, from all that years, years ago. Uh, somebody on the staff uh, knew her and uh, told her I'd mentioned her name. Oh. And uh, so uh, there's a, a connection over uh, many decades. So to, you to remained, that. you had some connection with her later on then. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's so right. this is a, a good example of why teachers make a difference. I want to stress that for Carolina Public Humanities, our interest in teachers and they can change a person's life. The, I think of uh, uh, the education of Henry Adams who says that, a teacher changes eternity. Yeah. Uh, and uh, my uh, step for in connection with the honorary degree that you nicely mentioned, uh, my uh, wife, Jean Ann, got together with one of my former students, now at former students at North Carolina, uh, who is now a professor of history in Texas. And they gathered a whole number of uh, my other uh, students from Columbia, from North Carolina, and uh, did a Zoom, and I can see uh, maybe 30 faces on, wow. on screen. And what they all remember is they should not use the passive voice. <laughs> <laughs> so see, you had a big impact. <laughs> Teachers shaped you and you shaped other people. Yeah. So let me ask you something else about those years. You mentioned being there during the Depression years in the yeah. 1930s. Um, what are your earliest memories of public political events or presidents? Um, did you ever have any early memories of Franklin Roosevelt or ever see him during that period of the 1930s? The one uh, day when I was in second grade, uh, a big honcho from the Department of Education uh, came to our school and he asked, there was a number of classes were gathered there. Uh, and he said, what is the name, what is the first name of the Roosevelt, uh, who is the governor of our state and who is being talked about as president of the United States? Well, there were cries of, around the room, Theodore, Teddy, finally silence. And uh, he enlightened us. It was Franklin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Wow. And I said to myself, I ought to keep that name in my <laughs> <laughs> So your relationship with Franklin Roosevelt began in the second grade when you heard his name mentioned at your school. Right, right. But then there was a, a, 
a later development. I, uh, I felt when I was graduated from high school that uh, I was going to have to go stay at home and go off on a train, uh, L train, uh, to uh, a municipal college in New York. And I had my heart set on going to Cornell, mm -hmm. your alma mater. Good school, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the, there was something about that name that caught my uh, uh, imagination. Uh, but no way I could, my family didn't have money to go to an Ivy League college for me to go. Uh, and. Uh, we never went away anywhere. We never had a car except for two weeks in the summer to my grandmother's farm in the Delaware Valley of Western New Jersey. And I came back from that two week stint in 1939 and our mailbox was bulging. And we never had anything in our mailbox but bills from the <laughs> electric company or somebody. Uh, but from one uh, envelope that I pulled out, a stuffed envelope, was a letter from one of my teachers and a, uh, a newspaper clipping saying that I'd won $100 uh, a year for four years to any uh, hmm. institution of higher education in New York State. Uh, then from another envelope came a letter from another teacher with a, uh, a, le a letter from the state and from, uh, the, uh, uh, from the, from the, uh, 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 from the, from oh, the, with the, with the clipping saying, I had in addition won $200 a year for four years to Cornell University. Really? <laughs> uh, hey, when we think of what, uh, <laughs> yeah, when we think of what tuition at an Ivy League college is I today, know, it's hard to believe that tuition then at Cornell was only $400 a year. But $400 left me $100 short, and my uh, family, for the best will, best will in the world, didn't have that money. So it was then. Uh, Late August, the university was opening up in late September. Uh, I looked around, the best I could find was a job of pushing a good humor bike around the uh, streets of Sunnyside. The only trouble was that a good humor cost twice as much as any other kind of ice cream bar. And uh, I would push, push, push all day long in the hot sun and be no closer to my goal than when I started. And then one day, a nice man in a good humor truck said that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was at the farthest end of Sunnyside uh, of, of dedicating the extension of Queens Boulevard. Oh. And that if I got to there, uh, I would be able to sell a lot. So I pedaled, 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 I think 23 blocks uh, over to the boulevard on a very hot day, and I sold out my uh, all the ice cream bars. And I never saw Franklin Roosevelt then. I later saw a lot of Eleanor Roosevelt and FDR Jr., uh, but uh, uh, he was uh, instrumental in. So uh, he helped you sell ice cream I bars. Sell, sell so ice cream he, he bars. He was going to build your career one way or another. That's yeah. great, but you didn't actually see him. You just sold I, ice cream bars right. to all the people. I one footnote to this. Uh, years later, I was commissioned to uh, do uh, an interview with Mario Cuomo when he was governor of New York, and he told me to take his helicopter out of Manhattan. Uh, flew out up over the Hudson, the Palisades, landed in an empty lot in Albany where a state trooper 
picked me up and took me to his office at the Capitol. And we had a great conversation uh, together. And at one point, uh, I said, you and I uh, both grew up in Queens. And uh, Cuomo said, Sunnyside, Sunnyside, <laughs> meaning that he had read that uh, account in the preface of, 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 of one of my books. And he said, you know, I never believed that story. You must have had coke, meaning cocaine. <laughs> but no, true story. That is how I got to go to Cornell. So when you went to Cornell, did you know you wanted to study history or were there teachers there who brought you into history? Uh, well, uh, I'll do it one at a time uh, on your question, see. I didn't know I was going to. In fact, I'd gotten very interested in liberal politics. Uh, the whole atmosphere of growing up was immersed in FDR's New Deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought political science was more mm -hmm. likely, but I, uh, I found that uh, the, I liked the history courses. I did better in history uh, than I did in anything else. And uh, there were uh, some remarkable history teachers who affected me. The, uh, in the whole time I was at Cornell, and indeed through my MA, I never took a course in American history. Oh, really? It was uh, elsewhere in the, in the world. There was a uh, renowned medieval historian, Carl Stevenson there, uh -huh. who had studied with Henri Piren in Belgium. And uh, he uh, uh, he had a big lecture course I was in, and then he arranged for a small section of only four students and picked me to be one of the four students. Mm. And he had just done a new book on feudalism, and the, the page proofs for the book were sitting there, my introduction of page proofs, uh -huh. and he autographed it, <clears throat> gave it to me. It was a prized possession. Uh, and the, other man I particularly think of was Knight Biggerstaff in the history mm -hmm. of China. Mm -hmm. uh, years later, I gave a set of lectures at Cornell that became a book, and uh, uh, Knight Biggerstaff was still around. He was there. I was right. able to, to was, uh, read it. Was Carl Becker still there? Ah, you there? well, that's a, you're right on point, uh, Lloyd, and that. Uh, uh, I would see Becker had just retired, oh. uh, and of course, an important figure in American as well as European history. Right. And uh, I would uh, see him walking on campus, and he was always spoken of with awe. And the uh, set of lectures I uh, was just talking about were the Becker lectures. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, but I was never. Never met him, uh, yeah. but uh, knew uh, how. He was the, the mentor of one of my good friends, R.R. R. Palmer. Who oh, yes. Studied at Cornell with Becker, and I always heard stories about him through yeah. Palmer. Um, yeah. Let me ask you this. When then did you decide not only you wanted to study history, but you wanted to become a professional historian? Did that happen while you were at Cornell, or were there events during the Second World War? Or It's a long <laughs> step from taking a good hey, history course as an undergrad yeah. to saying, I want to study this as a profession. It is. I, uh, my main interest uh, continued to be in liberal politics. Uh, uh -huh. When I was only 21, I was uh, the county director of the Liberal Party in, in Queens. I was uh, at age 23, I was the only white on the field staff of a civil rights organization mm -hmm. headed by A. Philip Randolph, uh, uh, who created the March on Washington. Mm -hmm. And then an organization was created, Americans for Democratic Action, which was composed of Eleanor Roosevelt, led by Eleanor Roosevelt, Reinhold Niebuhr, Walter Ruther, uh, lots of former New Dealers, and they asked me to head their student division. 
Oh, okay. So I came down to Washington and 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 did that, but uh, uh, this was during the war or right after? No, this was right after the war, and in uh, uh, in uh, 1948 uh, there was. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of what happened in 1948 where I was sent into Kansas City, Harry Truman's hometown, mm -hmm. uh, to uh, work in the campaign of Richard Bowling running for Congress for the first term. And uh, the, uh, uh, it was expected to be a disaster for Democrats, for liberals. Uh, but early that night, we learned that uh, that uh, Bowling had been elected. And then uh, Hubert Humphrey phoned in from Minnesota, uh, Adlai Stevenson, Paul Douglas from Illinois, Soapy Williams from Michigan, Chet Bowles from, from wow. uh, yeah. Connecticut. And uh, I went back to my office in Washington, and uh, there were uh, celebratory uh, telegrams, but Western Union was on strike, uh, so uh, messages could not be sent uh, specifying our achievement or our good fortune. And uh, instead, uh, uh, people adroitly chose one of the canned messages that you could send, many happy returns. <laughs> so that was the message that they were out. That's a uh, good one, though, for politics. Uh, yeah. And you're following the returns. Yeah. The, and, yeah. Then, <laughs> then, and then... And <laughs> then... It works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then four years later, uh, there was uh, uh, grave concern that uh, uh, the... Uh, Democrats would be badly beaten with Truman as their uh, mm -hmm. leader. I was teaching at Harvard then, uh, and I was, uh, my colleague Arthur Schlesinger Jr. Uh, uh, called a luncheon together of uh, people like the economist Jay Kenneth Galbraith, uh, the uh, 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 conservation man, Bernard Devoto and others, and uh, I was persuaded uh, to uh, fly out to uh, Utah uh, to push the uh, uh, presidential candidacy of of uh, of, uh, of Averill Harriman, uh, who uh, was the most outspoken uh, figure on civil rights in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that year, uh, but uh, the uh, uh, most of the uh, ADA office in Washington uh, was uh, uh, pushing for the nomination of Eisenhower for on the Democratic ticket. Uh, that didn't seem to me to be a very wise idea, and I thought I better take some time off and think through what's going on here. And uh, I was uh, uh, had a home and a background in New York, so I decided I would enter Columbia University where there were renowned uh, historians. And I worked under Henry Steele Commager. And, uh, so he was your main advisor? Commander? He was my main advisor, mm -hmm. and uh, I managed to pass my PhD orals, uh, write a dissertation that was still in the area of liberal politics, and uh, to my astonishment, uh, was appointed an assistant professor at Harvard. Mm. And I was in Har at Harvard only a few weeks, uh, when Commenter phoned me and said that Alan Nevins, who had won the Pulitzer Prize, uh, 
for his biographies had decided to retire and uh, they uh, considered numbers of uh, well-known national figures, but decided on me instead. So, so you came in as an assistant professor at that at, point? At, on a tenure line, still in my 20s. Wow. Yeah. So you made the leap then from the ADA and liberal politics yeah. into academia by studying in the graduate program at Columbia. Were you Correct. still doing the political activity during that period? Yes. While, uh, and in fact, while uh, 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 teaching at Columbia, I uh, became uh, New York State Chairman of Americans for Democratic oh. Action uh, and uh, became involved in, uh, uh, in other campaigns. Uh, what I've, I mentioned this to Harvard, actually, there's, I've left out a couple of steps in between. I taught economics at New York University and government at Smith College. And when I was teaching at Smith College, I managed the campaign of a woman running for Congress in the uh, second congressional district. So I was as much doing that as I was. So is that why it was attractive to you when the opportunity came to move from Harvard back to Columbia because you had political ties more in New York than in in Massachusetts. Well, it was a mix of that and uh, uh, having high regard for the, for the Columbia History Department, yeah. which had been my own so department. What was it about Henry Steele Commager that made him so impressive to you? I'm just curious as, to, as a mentor, as an advisor, as a historian. Uh, well, he was so full of life. I, I, I started to go like this when you asked the, asked the uh, yeah. uh, question. Uh, he had such a, a catholicity of, of tastes. He was as at home in European history as mm -hmm. in, in American history. He was a leading civil libertarian. Uh, uh, and yeah. yeah. So Good man. Do you think that your your study of European history gave you a helpful perspective as you plunged into U.S. history? Oh, absolutely. How how did the study of Europe give you a deeper or better sense of what you wanted to do in U.S. history? It uh, uh, to say the most obvious, it gave me a comparative perspective, mm -hmm. and it also freed me from the notion that everything worthwhile that happened in the country happened in the United States. Yeah. Uh, I knew about the progressive movement in Great Britain. Uh, I uh, was later to write of the way in which uh, some New Dealers uh, thought, of, thought of Sweden as yeah. uh, a model for what how the New Deal was going to come. So, so you never believed in, in the idea of American exceptionalism exactly. You always saw connections that connected European culture and politics with American. That's a that's a uh, uh, a first rate conclusion for you to draw. But I'd have to say every American historian <laughs> believes in American exceptionalism, <laughs> except for the politicians. Right? Yeah. So. Well, let me ask you then a, a little more about Roosevelt. Um, when did you become especially interested in writing about Roosevelt and his presidency? Was it while you were still in graduate school or after that or in that I, first decade at Columbia? I, it was really when uh, there was a great series of, uh, of books, uh, the American Nation series, yeah. circa 1912. And uh, uh, Harper, published by Harper, and Harper, uh, headed by Cass Canfield, uh, decided they wanted to do that all over again. Oh. So two uh, Columbia historians, Commager and Richard B. Morris, uh, 
were asked to uh, uh, create a new series of books updated uh, with a new set of historians. And uh, they asked me to do, well, what they first asked me to do was a volume on 20th century intellectual history. Mm -hmm. And I started work on that, but then something went awry with the man who was supposed to do the volume on the 1930s. So they said, would I be willing to switch over to that? So, yes. So Commager once again had a big impact uh, on absolutely. your life and career. Absolutely. He sounds like a real um, uh, foundation for yeah. a lot of what you did. Exactly. I, I told you once that I met him at my college and I was so impressed with him as a, as a speaker, as a human being. So yeah. I can yeah. see why. Yeah. Um, let me ask you then about political history. You, it sounds like you were interested in everything from medieval feudalism to the history of <laughs> ideas to political theory, even liberalism. Yeah. What made political history become the, the field you wanted to focus on? Well, it was almost certainly the impact of the New Deal. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I remember in, uh, uh, when I was uh, a boy of nine, uh, the, uh, I learned how to uh, create a box score for the World Series, draw nine innings, uh, and uh, fill in the uh, Philadelphia Athletics against the St. Louis Cardinals. I can still tell you the lineups of both teams. Really? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll just do the infields. Uh, I say, well, Saint that's good preparation for politics, <laughs> I think. St. Louis Cardinals, Sonny Jim Bottomley at first, Frankie Frisch at second, the oh rookie God. Charlie Gelbert at short, and Sparky Adams or Andy High at third. What Phil year was this? What, what this series? Would have, well, this would have been probably 31. Uh, wow, I, I think that's a low-frequency memory. The starting infield for the... <laughs> And, the athletics in the 1931 World Series. So and uh, <laughs> and uh, Philadelphia Athletics, Jimmy Fox on first, Max Bishop at second, uh, Dib Williams at short, J Jimmy Dykes at third. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that, that was a kind of detail that prepared you for studying politics. Well, <laughs> uh, what this leads to, Lloyd, is that... Uh, and a uh, uh, June night, uh, when I was nine, my uh, parents, who insisted I turn in at nine every night, let me stay up as late as I wanted to listen to the uh, 1932 Democratic National Convention. Uh -huh. And again, I can tell you there was Franklin D. Roosevelt, Al Smith, uh, the uh, 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 Newton D. Baker, uh, Owen D. Young, uh, the uh, well, I'll spare you the uh, uh, John Nance Garner, uh, and uh, uh, as I had done the columns, I did the columns here, uh, uh, roll call after roll call. I can still remember. Uh, a man from New Je from New Jersey with a thick Irish brogue uh, saying, New Jersey cost its 32 votes for that great American Alfred E. Smith. <laughs> and uh, so, and then uh, when Roosevelt was elected, uh, the... Uh, uh, there was uh, every day's newspaper carried a new agency, a new story. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, such an uh, such an exciting time that if you didn't get hooked on politics, there was something dense about you. Yeah. Uh, and I remember uh, the big uh, uh, relief measure of the first hundred days was the. NRA with the symbol of the Blue Eagle. Uh -huh. And 
uh, my teachers gave me a, a, a Blue Eagle uh, thing, a piece of paper with paste on the back. I brought it home to my mother, and she put it up in our uh, uh, in our uh, the window of our kitchen, uh, and it it followed like that year in year so out. Your, your parents were also supporters of Roosevelt. No. They were not. My father was not at all. He was a Republican? Hey. Yes. Well, that, so, then, <laughs> so now we get into a more complex uh, psychoanalytic yeah. dimension of that. So breaking out in this direction was really a, a break from your family then as well. Oh, it was. was. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but it was cool. tolerated. Yeah. Yeah. So when you wrote this book on Franklin Roosevelt and yeah. the New Deal, what did you most want your readers to take away from this period of American history and, and the Roosevelt administration? Uh, well, it, uh, with, uh, with your background in European history and uh, German history, of, uh, it was mostly a sense of uh, uh, eigentlich evasion. That is, uh, mm -hmm. I wanted this t to be what was true. Yeah. Uh, uh, to organize the uh, all these different alphabetical agencies in ways that one could comprehend, mm -hmm. and then in a, I had a final chapter in which I gave an interpretation of what the uh, 1930s uh, was uh, that allowed me to spring free from that kind of of, uh, of stricture and uh, talk about what the long-term meaning was of the so New what, Deal. What do you think even now is most significant about Roosevelt and his presidency? Why did he matter so much to the United States and to the world? For yeah, well, one of his uh, speech writers uh, was uh, a, uh, oh, why am I blocking on the name? Was uh, a leading playwright of the uh, period uh, uh, who uh, wrote a, a biography of, of, uh, of Harry Hopkins, uh, and in the course of which he said that uh, 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 Roosevelt had a good act to follow. <laughs> in, meaning Hoover, meaning, we, we, meaning yeah. Herbert Hoover, and uh, it's often said that uh, for somebody to be called a great president, as Roosevelt is, uh, he has to have a great challenge. Uh, mm -hmm. But Hoover had a great challenge in the uh, in the Depression, and though he wasn't quite the uh, uh, do nothing president he's thought to be. He also uh, uh, failed to take any of the steps that that FDR did of uh, uh, creating a powerful national government that uh, uh, helped get the country somewhere out of the depression, mm -hmm. but more important, uh, created the basis of the welfare state. Mm -hmm. uh, most obviously in the Social Security Act, uh, yeah. which has been so important for us during this uh, pandemic yeah. with not only Social Security, but uh, with uh, uh, unemployment insurance. So he had two great, not only the Great Depression, and then he's he's got World War II. Which exactly. Is, <laughs> that's, a, that's more than most presidents have to deal that with. Is Even right. one of those is more yeah. than most presidents. Have to deal exactly. With. Yeah. Yeah. So it was his ability to confront these challenges and somehow maintain his equilibrium and give other people the hope that they could get through it. Yeah. The hope is a very important yeah. part of of all of this. The yeah. sense that. Uh, uh, that we were going to pull through. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. So um, how you, you mentioned that it takes a, 
a great challenge to make a great president, and yeah. there have been other great challenges. How how do you think Roosevelt compares to the greatest? Or people think of the greatest presidents like George Washington, Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, I don't know who would be the other. Uh, I don't know who who would yeah. you compare him to. Well, American historians uh, uh, from time to time uh, get a phone call from. Uh, Time Magazine, Newsweek, New York Times, asking us to rate uh, uh, presidents. And there is now a consensus that there are only three great American presidents. And that the three you just mentioned, not surprisingly, uh, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the most recent polls, uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, moved past George Washington mm. to be regarded as the second greatest yeah. of all time, which is to say uh, the greatest uh, since uh, since Abraham Lincoln, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, uh, the greatest for uh, an extraordinary period of time. Yeah. So that none of the more recent presidents uh, matches that. So uh, you, you wrote the book in the shadow of FDR. I did. And <laughs> were there any of the presidents from Truman to Obama uh, who had even a remotely uh, comparable impact, do you think, to, to Roosevelt? Who of those presidents? I, I would say uh, simply no. Uh, when you've done something for the first time, it's then hard uh, yeah. for the next guy to come along uh, and do something remarkably new. But of those uh, presidents, uh, the one I think is underappreciated is Harry Truman. Mm -hmm. If you are uh, interested in the presidency as an institution, so many of the institutions we take for granted today, uh, from the Council of Economic Advisors to the CIA, to, to uh, the fact that there, there is a, a whole uh, department given to security. All this starts under, under Harry Truman. And when you add to this the uh, the, all of the institutions of the Cold War, such as the Marshall Plan, mm -hmm. and then uh, add uh, further to this that he was the president who appointed a civil rights commission. Uh, it's a, it's a pretty impressive. Uh, so although record. he followed a very powerful president, yeah. he did a lot. Uh, hey. Unlike uh, you were saying, if you follow a weak president, yeah. it yeah. gives you an advantage. Yeah. So uh, it's interesting. People think about whether Biden at the present time is facing challenges that are comparable to past presidents. And oh. with the pandemic, with the economic downturn, with the, with the whole debate about democracy, uh, well, I've he's got some big challenges. I, I've, I've actually talked about that. Uh, I, I think... Biden really uh, has the uh, possibility of becoming a historically significant president. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's off to a good start uh, with what he has done uh, so far. He, f he faces one difficult problem that Roosevelt didn't face. Uh, Roosevelt, in the first hundred days, had numbers of progressive Republicans in the United oh, States Senate. Yeah. Uh, men like Hiram Johnson of California, who'd run on the Bull Moose ticket with Teddy Roosevelt uh -huh. in 1912. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, unfortunate situation now is that the uh, Republicans in the Senate seem bent on, uh, on totally blocking any kind of achievement, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Biden is uh, going to be talking about this 
just about now. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, to what, what so, is to do. One of the big issues, of course, that we're wrestling with now is the issue of race and the legacy of yeah. racism. What was Roosevelt? You talked about he had these uh, liberal Republicans. Did uh, he have these Southern Democrats who he did. were deeply invested in the systemic racism of Jim Crow? He did. How, how did he deal with the issues of race? And how would you describe his his view of, of women and other groups that had been marginalized traditionally in American politics? Well, let me take the second one uh, first, since it's the most recent. Uh, he named the first woman ever named to a cabinet position, uh, Frances Perkins, oh, yeah. Secretary of Labor. It's hard to believe that all those years had gone by, and all the way until 1933, without a woman in uh, Any cabinet position. Yeah, yeah. and uh, he. Uh, uh, Is she from Cornell, by the way? No, but you're right that there's a connection because after she retired, uh, she uh, uh, headed a uh, school of labor industrial and development. I, and I was at Cornell, there's a Francis Perkins school yeah. or something. Yeah, right. yeah. right. Anyway, I, I digress. No, <laughs> no. Uh, and uh, there were, uh, uh, he, there were other appointments too. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, first woman envoy uh, abroad, for example, uh, first woman federal court judge. Oh, uh, he was the first. Uh, and uh, he uh, uh, had uh, 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 a, a very active women's division of the Democratic Party in, uh, in 1936 uh, that uh, had carried that on through the rest of his the presidency. Now, to get to your former point, uh, it's often pointed out that uh, no civil rights legislation was passed under FDR, mm-hmm. uh, uh, in good part because, uh, uh, of, as you were saying, that there was a strong block of, of Southern senators who could filibuster uh, civil rights legislation. Uh, when uh, when Truman was president, I uh, sat up in the uh, mezzanine and watched that happen on a piece of civil rights uh, legislation. It was very, very difficult, even with cloture uh, as an option, uh, to get anything through. But Roosevelt did do uh, uh, as much as he he could do uh, as the, with, with the, con, uh, among other things, in uh, uh, providing uh, public housing uh, mm-hmm. in, uh, in, in black communities. Uh, he issued an executive order for uh, fair employment practices in uh, World War II. And as early as 1936, at the end of his first campaign, there was a marked shift in attitude in the country. Mm -hmm. As late as 1932, when he ran for president for the first time, the uh, uh, black wards like Ward 14 in Cincinnati uh, voted for Hoover Mm -hmm. because he was the candidate of the party of the great emancipator. Uh, And in 1936, there was a prominent black politician, the leading black politician in Pennsylvania, uh, uh, who told his constituents, uh, turn Lincoln's picture to the wall. That debt has been paid in full. Mm. And in 1936, of uh, uh, black precincts went overwhelmingly for Roosevelt when they have been ever since. So the movement of the majority of the black <laughs> voting community to the Democratic Party took place under Roosevelt. That's exactly Trump. right. Yeah. And that's one of his other legacies, even if he didn't pass the civil rights legislation. Yeah. So um, a final question about Roosevelt before we move on. Um, 
do you think he made, what would you say was his biggest mistake or flaw? Have you ever found, was there something, from your study of Roosevelt, huh. if you look at his career, where did he most go down the wrong path? Well, I know what most people would say, but I would not say. Uh, and that is when uh, he advocated packing the Supreme yeah. Court yeah. in 1937. I've written a book about uh -huh. that, and I'm writing another book about it. Uh, and uh, what is left out of this is uh, the difficult situation he confronted in 1937, where the Supreme Court had uh, struck down uh, both the NRA that we were talking about before and his farm program. And beyond that, even state legislation for minimum wage for women. And there was every expectation that it was going to strike down the Social Security Act and the Wagner National Labor Relations Act. And he uh, uh, advocated increasing the Supreme Court. And it's pointed out that that bill was defeated, as indeed it was in July 1937, but uh, as was also said at the time, uh, the there was a switch in time that saved nine, that a uh, a Supreme Court uh, Justice Owen Roberts, no con no relation to the current mm -hmm. Chief Justice Roberts. Uh, joined the more liberal judges on the uh, on the court and uh, upheld Social Security Act, Wagner so Act, things huge, of that yeah. sort. Yeah. But then, in addition, all of similar measures after, after that. It started, in fact, with their upholding a minimum wage law from the state of Washington, West Coast Hotel v. Parish, uh, actually not as uh, broad as the ones they had struck down in the Topaldo case in, in 36. And they went on so far to expand the commerce power that in one case they ruled that a janitor who stoked the furnace that warmed the fingers of a seamstresses up above in the factory who made garments that were shipped in interstate commerce was himself in interstate uh -huh. commerce. Uh -huh. So there were hardly any limits to what the national government could do uh, with respect to social economic reform after that happened. Yeah. So this effort to pack the court, which has been widely condemned as a failure, yeah. actually made some difference in made. getting people's attention, changing the court even a little yeah. bit. Yeah. And who knows, maybe Biden, he may face exactly the same problem. To go back to your point about how do you get things done, he could face the same problem with the court that Roosevelt did. It's quite possible, and there is indeed now, there has been for the last year, uh, uh, advocacy from some groups for a court packing. I, I rather doubt that that's something that Biden is going to yeah. embrace, uh, knowing that it had been defeated the previous time. So. Was there some other, you said you wouldn't have cho chosen the one that other people said was a mistake. Do you see something else that was a mistake? Did he miss well, Judge uh, Hitler? Did he make a mistake about the Japanese? Did he, was there anything else? Well, we, uh, I've always thought that uh, historians uh, uh, should not, uh, second guess yeah, men right. who are faced with the uh, problems of making decisions in in 
Congress. I don't mean at all that Roosevelt was flawless, but uh, I certainly find understandable yeah. decisions he made that uh, didn't turn out well. Yeah. I, I know one of the most controversial decisions has to do with the acceptance of Jewish refugees fleeing Europe during the war, right before oh. you know, that kind of thing was often uh, criticized. Well, that's a, that's, I'm, uh, I'm glad that you uh, made this point. Uh, I understand the difficulty uh, that he faced when, uh, uh, when the United States went to war against uh, mm -hmm. Nazi Germany, anti-Semitism rose in the yeah. United States. Yeah. That there was, uh, a, with the country uh, under uh, a uh, still massive unemployment, yeah. the, uh, it was hard to argue that uh, thousands, millions more people ought to be brought into the job market. Uh, that having been said, I, I can, uh, I'm very unhappy about, mm -hmm. uh, about uh, FDR's not doing more than and, he and did. Then, um, the other big issue, of course, oh, the internment of the Japanese, the Japanese Americans. Americans. Yeah. That was, that was a tragic situation. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and there, I think, unjustifiable. Yeah, uh, that was maybe one of his least justified yeah. actions. Yeah. Or maybe the most unjustified. Yeah. We're, we're going to open this up to questions in a minute, but I want to ask you just a couple of more questions about the public engagement, the public humanity. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I wonder, when you moved from Columbia to UNC, to teach here and be in a different state, a different yeah. political context. Did you find that the, the cultures of these two um, academic worlds were very different and that it require a different kind of engagement with the public for you to be in these, to be uh, in North Carolina as compared to New York? When, uh, when I was uh, talking to members of the history department here, one of them raised the point that I, I might not want to come to the University of North Carolina because I wouldn't have the easy access. Uh, yeah. That thought uh, actually never crossed my mind. I knew I wanted to come. <laughs> uh, you had uh, Carolina on the mind. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, but beside that, that isn't what's happened. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, some issue arises and I get a phone call and it says uh, there'll be a limo uh, at your home at six o'clock tomorrow morning and we'll take you over to the NBC or whatever studio in Raleigh and you'll be on the eight o'clock uh, morning news. Uh, there hasn't been any change in that. Or so I, I'm wondering like you were always at a private university. I mean, Columbia, or yeah. Harvard, or Smith College. UNC is a public university, obviously, yeah. as we know. Yeah. And we, uh, as faculty there, are very aware of our relation to the legislature, to the governor, yeah. to the public world. Do you think it makes a difference to teach at a public university as compared to a private university? I don't. And uh, some years ago, uh, the Carnegie, Carnegie Foundation was, uh, uh, no, I'm wrong, it was the Mellon Foundation, was concerned about uh, uh, graduate students uh, not going into teaching and uh, wanted to uh, examine, have a new ways of uh, graduate instruction. And they gave me a a lot of money and uh, to take care of that. And uh, one of my uh, former PhD students at Columbia, uh, who has become a highly successful uh, professor at Duke, 
was Bill Chafe. Oh, yeah. So I told Bill, well, let's uh, split this money between Duke and, uh, mm -hmm. and UNC students. Uh, and uh, I couldn't see any difference between that private university yeah, and our. Yeah, yeah. The only time I've ever had any criticism for my political activity wasn't here. Oh. I've never had a word from the North Carolina legislature. Uh, but uh, when uh, there was a uh, committee of 100 for a presidential candidate uh, in New York, uh, and uh, I was on that committee, and my name was in the New York Times with Columbia University, a, uh, an alumnus got in touch with the trustees and uh, the administration uh, gave me a little heat about that that didn't amount to anything. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't bother uh, you too much. No. I remember I was on that committee with Bobby Mercer, who was the new center fielder for oh, the New York Yankees. Well, that was pretty good coming. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and a leading uh, NBA basketball player in California. Uh, not uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Not, mm -hmm. no, not someone who had been uh, a great set shots shooter in, that's hard to say, in uh, at Georgia Tech. Mm. Uh, in a few minutes, when it's too late, I'll think of his name. But, uh, but let me ask you one other question, and then I want to ask Paul if we have some, do we have some questions coming in, and we need to move on. But a final issue, you've been very involved with Ken Burns on documentaries. He, yes. What have you learned from doing document, historical documentary films, and do you think it's a good thing that you've been involved with that? And, or should historians be involved with filmmakers like that? Oh, I absolutely think so. And Ken is a marvelous man to work with, uh, with uh, broad ranging tastes. I've, uh, he has uh, his home and studio are in Western New Hampshire. Uh, when uh, he, uh, uh, Calls Jean Ann and me up for uh, to see the uh, uh, first uh, uh, screenings. Uh, he often puts us up in a inn where you look out and you see Vermont. It's that yeah. it's that far uh, west. Uh, and uh, two summers ago, because of the pandemic, uh, things have been quiet. But two summers ago, uh, he uh, asked me to come over a day early uh, every uh, August. He has a big jamboree of uh, invites uh, friends, uh, participants in past films, new films over to his place. And uh, uh, at this time, uh, he uh, asked me to come a day early and uh, set me down before a camera and interviewed me over two hours on four different films that are, uh, are on their way. It's not one of those things uh -huh. where you can say when you get a question, wait a minute, I'll go over and look yeah. this up. No. You, you talk, and uh, it's... Do you have a particular Ken Burns documentary that you think is the most interesting or the best in your view? Well, I, I really admire just about all of them, oh. actually. <laughs> uh, From baseball well, to the Civil War well, baseball to Mark Twain. To... <laughs> yes, <laughs> baseball and National Parks are my National favorite Parks. ones yeah. to have to have done on, uh, on uh, when he told me he was doing baseball, I, uh, uh, I did a 19-page single-spaced uh, 
uh, yellow, big legal pad history of baseball wow. in nine innings for him, had nine parts, and that's the pattern that he used in the in the history. Well, this took you back to the 1931 World Series, a great <laughs> circle from the infield of the Philadelphia <laughs> Athletics to the baseball uh, documentary of Ken Burns. Well, you know, it actually with Roosevelt in between. You're you're <laughs> you're teasing me in a, in a lovely way, but in fact that happened. Uh, <laughs> Before we uh, uh, look at the uh, screens, we go over the uh, uh, script each time. And for baseball, there was a script reading at the uh, uh, Roger. What's the screen name? Uh, there's a, oh dear, chain name. Roger Smith, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, hotel in Washington. And uh, it was a little boy's dream because I was uh, between uh, the, uh, uh, the head of the uh, uh, baseball encyclopedia and the uh, mm -hmm. uh, baseball writer, brilliant writer for the New Yorker. Uh, and uh, the script at one point said that, uh, uh, talking about those athletics of that yeah. time, that uh, the uh, the catcher uh, for the uh, for the athletics was uh, so fast that he was the leadoff man. And I said, Ken, I, I don't know this for sure. I don't have anything at hand, but that doesn't seem right to me. Uh, Mickey Cochran. Uh, and uh, the meantime, as, as I, I'm going down with that list, and I said, uh, they, we were just talking about it, and I said, I think the leadoff man was probably Max Bishop, the second baseman. Meantime, the uh, encyclopedia guy is going page by page and he says Max Bishop was the <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't man. need the baseball so, encyclopedia so, they just needed so you <laughs> that, uh, uh, that put me in like Flynn uh, with the That's other good. experts That's around good. the room so it did happen Yeah. so let me ask Paul if he could uh, Paul Benici is monitoring a few questions do you have one you'd like to share with us Paul well, sure. I'll just go straight from the top and read them in the okay. order that they if came in. Okay, if there's something, or if you want to consolidate there, well, there a couple, are a couple of them. that are related to FDR, and then a few more modern kind of questions. So, can you hear him? Okay, I, I'm, yeah. I, I, I'll I, speak up a little bit. If, if that, can you I, hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, so we have a question here from our friend Trisha Topping, um, and she asks, "Why did FDR act on Treasury Secretary Morgenthau's advice?" to slash government spending. FDR must have understood the immediate risks of Im implementing an austerity policy. Ah, well, yeah. uh, that's a good question. And the fact is that everybody thought, uh, everybody was, was regarded as a sensible economist that uh, the, there was great danger in unbalanced budgets. And uh, there's uh, that uh, FDR was endangering uh, uh, future generations by the unbalanced budgets that he had by the, by the spending. And uh, in 1937, it wasn't just Morgenthau's influence, but his own uh, perception of things that a uh, time had to come when he would stop uh, spending at the rate he was spending. And in 1937, uh, he decided to cut back on, on federal spending. Uh, the, uh, it turned out to be a very bad decision, as the, the, question, is, the question implies. Uh, it led to the 
uh, uh, to the uh, uh, recession of 1937 and 38 uh, that we didn't recover from until the wartime spending of of uh, World War II. Hmm. There was always concern about deficit spending, wasn't there? Yeah. Go ahead, Paul. All right, so we have a, a question from our colleague, uh, Dr. Max Orr. And he asks, he says, FDR's New Deal was criticized by right-wing politicians as a socialist takeover of the government. During the Cold War, anti-communism animated both parties, but was seemingly compatible with a large Keynesian state. Today, promoting basic social state functions common in developed countries is demonized as communism by Republicans. Could you speak to the power of anti-communism in American political culture? Could we sell a new deal today? The, uh, uh, the, it, it would probably not uh, to answer your, your last uh, question. Although uh, there is uh, much talk, uh, has been for the last two, three years, about a Green New Deal, about uh, expanding uh, environmental measures with, uh, uh, with uh, spending uh, that would result in uh, new employment opportunities for those uh, who are without work. Uh, and that, in essence, is uh, what uh, President Biden is doing, though uh, the Green New Deal has gotten such a bad reputation uh, from uh, conservative publicists that he probably won't uh, use that language, but will use uh, other la language uh, to justify what he's doing. In fact, he is already talking about this as a work uh, mm -hmm. uh, measure, uh, a way to expand employment in the in the United States. D did the Republicans denounce the New Deal as communism? Uh, and did the Republican Party ever come to turn? Did did Republicans ever accept the New Deal, or would you say the critique? of the New Deal remains potent and powerful today in Republican circles. Yeah, I think the uh, the language that's being used by Republican senators today, Republican politicians today, is not very different from what was said in the in the 1930s. Uh, there was a difference, as I said earlier, that there were progressive Republicans mm -hmm. as who have virtually disappeared today. Uh, there are a few uh, Republicans uh, like uh, Susan Collins, for example, uh, the senators from Alaska, from Nebraska, who uh, sometimes will, uh, will give support to liberal measures, but for the most part can't be counted on. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, that kind of uh, of uh, acceptance uh, we're still still looking for. The, what can be said is that in the uh, 1950s, uh, Eisenhower, who though uh, he still continued the anti-communist rhetoric and still continued to criticize New Deal measures, uh, nonetheless uh, was willing uh, to espouse uh, measures uh, such as a national highway system uh, mm -hmm. that was not unlike that of the New Deal in which mm -hmm. built the Pennsylvania Turnpike and uh, measures of that sort in the 1930s. That's interesting. So really from Goldwater to Reagan, you have the post-Eisenhower reaction that, in a sense, continues the denunciation of the New Deal. Yeah. So, so there's a long-term continuity there. Yeah. 
Okay, is there another question, Paul? Yes, so these are more modern. Um, we have one from our friend Sam Jackson, and he says, what American historians or historical works could have best helped us anticipate and survive the past four years? Uh, uh, the sad fact is probably nothing. Uh, there has never been anything like uh, the... Uh, the four years of of Trump, and more particularly, uh, the attempted coup, and we've heard just in the past couple of days of an advocacy of uh, of of a coup on an uh, on an Asian model. We there's historians have never had to deal with anything that outrageous in the past. Uh, I think the it's the other way around that the experience of the last four four years is going to lead historians uh, to write numbers of different books that uh, will warn of the dangers to uh, our democratic society, dangers that we didn't think that uh, we were confronting, mm -hmm. and then place. The, uh, the uh, contributions of the past in a in a new light, not to take for granted the fact that uh, that uh, we have gone through uh, this period of a, a couple of centuries and more without ever having to confront anything this dreadful. So. If I could just follow up on that, in North Carolina, for example, we had the systemic disenfranchisement of all black voters after yeah. 1900. But do you think there is anything, do you think democracy itself is at greater risk right now in the United States than in any period you've studied? I do. Even uh, how, on the eve of the Civil War? I do. Yes. And what what makes the threat to democracy greater now than it has ever been in the last 225 years? Because it isn't simply sectional. There are millions of mm. people who are persuaded that the uh, election was stolen mm -hmm. uh, and uh, who uh, are willing to embrace uh, 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 violent uh, measures. That's something that, for what I think of, given your own field, I have again and again said I think of Weimar. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, something that the Weimar Republic was not expecting in the in the early years, uh, yeah. and uh, with the uh, with this. Uh, a brutal attack on the capital, mm -hmm. uh, uh, bringing to mind uh, the uh, uh, stormtrooper mm -hmm. mentality, the uh, the burning of the Reichstag, mm -hmm. matters of that sort. So you've been following American politics since the conventions of 1932. Yeah. This is a person with wise perspective. But in all those years, you've never seen any, even in the most critical moments of the late 60s or other times, there was never a questioning of the democracy itself as there is now. No, there have been uh, uh, movements like McCarthyism yeah. that yeah. were uh, uh, very troubling, but they never went to this excess. Yeah. No. Okay, we have another question. We do, and it sort of relates to what you were just discussing. Uh, it's from our friend Ellen Bradley, and she asks, both mi misinformation and disinformation played a significant role in the 2020 presidential election. Can Dr. Luchtenberg provide a historical perspective on the role of misinformation and disinformation in national election elections during the early to mid 20th century? Well, we could even go back to the very beginning and uh, find uh, 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 
misstatements, uh, uh, certainly in the uh, uh, in the age of Jackson, there were all kinds of uh, of of statements that were uh, that were inaccurate uh, attempts to uh, create alarm on the part of voters with uh, uh, claims that were that were that were baseless. Uh, what uh, what is uh, different uh, in the past two uh, presidential elections is uh, not uh, simple pieces of misinformation, but whole systems of of mm -hmm. denial of of reality and uh, uh, creating alarm that uh, that if the uh, uh, if the uh, democratic candidates if the rivals of the president president elect uh, were not defeated that the country would be in grave danger uh, these were absurd uh, statements, not simply uh, single uh, charges such as that a uh, uh, presidential uh, candidate's wife uh, was unfaithful, but dealing with the whole gestalt of, mm -hmm. uh, of American politics. And, and they never had Facebook or Twitter back in the day, so the possibility to spread misinformation has grown exponentially. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So, Paul, is there maybe one more question? Or That's it, Tom. Okay, so, well, that's good because I, I appreciate all the questions, but I want to come back to one final question about engagement with the public sphere. Yeah. And because we are Carolina public humanities, here. right? Uh, what would you say to younger historians, uh, people going into academia or already in academia, about the value of engaging with the public sphere? Is is this an enriching and important element? Is it a dangerous element? Do you see any risk in this? Why or how? Should historians engage with the public? Well, to start with, I, I, I wouldn't uh, think to advise any younger historian <laughs> uh, about what to do. Okay, and, that's that's wise, I'm sure. Uh, but I would say uh, that it has certainly enriched uh, my life, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that if you're an American citizen. Uh, that uh, and feels capable of making public statements. Uh, there's no reason you should not do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not saying you must do it. Uh, it's saying that uh, you'd be well advised to do it uh, because uh, uh, one always has to be careful not to confuse yourself with Nostradamus That's and, right. yeah. <laughs> and uh, think that because you know some things about the past, you know everything about the future. Uh, very unwise uh, to do. But you do know some things about the future. Uh, you uh, can set frameworks uh, uh, with regard to what we were just talking about to say that uh, that some kinds of, of fantasies that uh, have been spun in the last uh, two presidential elections uh, simply are not credible. And I explain why they're not. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, I've uh, been uh, I 
been happy to learn uh, not simply to uh, uh, say on television or films or on radio uh, what I've done, but to learn from uh, people in the media uh, what uh, what they know. Yeah. And uh, uh, so that is something that historians would find out if they become publicly engaged. Well, thank you so much. There are so many other issues we could talk about, including the present situation, the past situation, what it means to be a historian. But I, I want to thank <laughs> all of you who have joined us for this conversation. We've covered uh, quite a few decades. Um, we have benefited from the wisdom of our honorary degree recipient at the University of North Carolina, <laughs> whose granddaughter, by the way, uh, received her degree the same uh, commencement exercise. Right, right? we're classmates. Yes, yeah, so you see, it, what goes around comes around. Yeah. Jessica, right? Uh, yeah, yes, so, yes, right. So I want to thank Bill Luchtenberg for joining us. I want to thank him more generally for all he's done for our community, for the University of North Carolina, for the wider world of people who want to understand history. And I want to thank you for your commitments to public sure. engagement thank and for your work at Carolina Public Humanities. Thank you, and thank all of you for joining us. And I repeat the thanks to all of you. <laughs>